Reading the life of Saint Gregory, the illuminator of the Holy Master Blessed. Amen. Although the holy apostles Bartholomew and Thaddeus preached the saving faith of Christ in Armenia, it was not firmly established there until the mission of St. Gregory the Illuminator at the beginning of the fourth century. The circumstances of his ministry, however, compel us to begin our history from some years earlier than that time. During the reign of the Roman Emperor Valerian, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, and his son Sapor had bent their efforts to the conquest of Armenia. The king of Armenia, Chosroes, of the house of Arsacidia, made a noble resistance until he was assassinated by the emissaries of Sapor, who had then succeeded to the Persian crown. The Armenian aristocracy implored the assistance of Rome in behalf of Tiridates, the infant heir of the murdered monarch. This young prince was, by the fidelity of a servant, removed to Rome. The emperor Valerian perished during the war with Persia as he attempted, among other things, to restore the Armenian monarchy. Thus, Tiridates was brought up and educated under the protection of the Roman emperor. He possessed great physical strength. In an age of ease and luxury, he cultivated every manly quality. Indeed, in a sedition, he had saved the life of Licinius Caesar, and out of gratitude, the emperor Galerius restored him to the Armenian throne. When after living so many years in exile, Tiridates appeared on the borders of his native country, the inhabitants immediately took up arms against the Persians. The nobility of Armenia hastened to the service of their rightful king. Garrison after garrison yielded, the Persian archers were overthrown, the sacred perpetual flame of the Persians on the summit of Mount Bogavan was extinguished, and for some time the rule of King Tiridates appeared secure. This was in large measure due to the fact that internal difficulties had distracted Persia. These were at length resolved, and then the whole force of the Persian Empire was turned against Armenia. The Emperor Diocletian and his army, however, entered the conflict in behalf of Armenia and completely routed the Persians. Among the terms of the Roman victory were the restoration of King Tiridates to the Armenian throne and the enlargement of the borders of Armenia. In that land which was the prize of the victor, a nobler triumph awaited the Church of Christ. At the time when the infant Tiridates had been snatched from the victorious Persians, another infant prince of the same royal house was rescued from peril arising from another quarter and was likewise taken from his native land. Anak was of the Parthian royal house of the Arsacidae Arsis and was one of the chief men among the rulers of Parthia. He it, was, he it was who, at the instigation of the Persian Sassanid Emperor Sapor I in the year 258, assassinated the Armenian King Chosroes, the father of Tiridates. As Chosroes was dying of the mortal wound he had received from the dagger of Anak, he gave orders that the entire family of Anak be utterly annihilated. Anak's infant son, however, was rescued out of Armenia by his nurse, who took the babe with her to Caesarea of Cappadocia through the assistance of a Christian merchant who was then returning from Armenia to his home in Caesarea. Thus, by God's providence, Anak's son survived the massacre of his family and was adopted by the merchant sister Sophia and her husband, being baptized and raised as a Christian. In holy baptism, the infant received the name Gregory. Sophia bestowed great care in the proper rearing of her adopted son, Gregory, and saw to it that he was well-versed both in God's word and in necessary secular learning. As he was of the royal line of the Parthian Arsacidae, Sophia was concerned that he should marry as soon as he was of age, so that the succession to his house would not fail. Gregory, however, had no such intentions, neither would he have sought a wife for himself because of his choice to live an unhindered life of ascetic struggle. Yet still, out of obedience to his parents, he was joined in marriage to Mary, a maiden of noble birth and great piety, who bore him two sons, Bartunus and Aristakis. 
Three years after the birth of their children, Gregory and Mary were moved to separate from each other in order to devote themselves more completely to the pursuit of godliness. Having left all their property for the support of their sons, they abandoned all the things of the world. Mary entered a habitation of consecrated women, and there spent her life in great holiness. As for Gregory, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to enter the service of Tiridates, the newly restored king of Armenia, to seek to bring that land and its people to the light of Christ. The blessed Gregory thus became a personal attendant of King Tiridates, and greatly endeared himself to his royal master. The king, of course, did not know that Gregory was the son of the traitor who had slain his father, and he did not cease to wonder at Gregory's life and conduct full of grace, innocent, pure, and irreproachable, so that he loved him with special fondness, consulting him as an intimate friend on the most important matters of the kingdom. In the first year of his reign, having finally taken the kingdom of his ancestors in hand, King Tiridates went with all his court to bring offerings to the temple of the goddess Arachid in gratitude for all the success she had granted him. Now, while the king and his attendants were going up with wreaths and clustered branches of laurel to offer sacrifice to the idols, he perceived that his friend Gregory would have nothing to do with it, whereat he became very angry, inasmuch as, from the many faithful offices of Gregory, he fully suspected that he would also be one with him in paying due honor to his goddess. But the saint said to the king, the Lord of all teaches us in serving our masters to pay every attention to that which does not defile the soul. Wherefore, I never begrudged thee any act of such service, neither, neither did I ever do aught by constraint. But as to that service which places the soul in danger and estranges us from our Creator, we ought never to have anything to do with it. Yea, not even when he who gives the order is our sovereign and has power over our life. The king was perplexed and very much grieved by these words, but being greatly attached to Gregory, he did not slay him outright. Instead, he ordered him to be removed from his presence and kept in confinement in his own house that day. On the morrow, King Tiridates commanded that the saint be brought before him, and he examined him closely, inquiring as to the meaning of Gregory's behavior on the previous day, and threatened him with hardships, degradation, imprisonment, chains, torments, and death if he would not obey and worship the idols. The saint was not affected, however, but proclaimed Christ as true God and demonstrated in his speech that the things threatened would, if suffered for Christ's sake, actually be true honor, glory, repose, health, and immortal life. The blessed Gregory thus spoke bright words full of the grace of the Holy Spirit. But the king, enraged by this, gave orders that he should be given over to grievous torment. The king first commanded that the saint's hands should be tied behind his back, and also that a bit be put in his mouth, and a heavy lump of rock salt on his shoulders. They then harnessed him, and with his face to the earth made him run for some time like a beast of burden. This was because he had said to them that in their worship of idols they were like horses and mules with no understanding and no thought to seek after God. St. Gregory endured this torture with long suffering in hunger and privation most valiantly by the grace of Christ. After that, they proceeded to put an instrument of torture on his chest and then to tie cords to it. Being thus bound, they heaved him up and down against the walls of the palace he remained tied up, bound, and suspended for seven days. During this entire time of torment, not only did he neither complain nor show signs of pain, but with a joyful heart he glorified our Lord Jesus Christ to the astonishment of the bystanders who went and told it to the king. After seven days, King Theodakis commanded that St. Gregory be released from his bonds and, uh, and cruel torture. They brought him and placed him before the king, whole, unhurt, and rejoicing in heart. The king was amazed at seeing him in no wise weakened in body or altered in his serene countenance. He asked him how he had been able to endure, to suffer, and still exist, and what he thought of all he had undergone, and he threatened him with worse treatment if he would not obey and worship the gods. But St. Gregory remained steadfast, pouring contempt on the idols, and glorifying Christ the true God. Notwithstanding the bright light of truth proclaimed by the saint, Tiridates grew no wiser, being as yet enveloped in a thick gloom of ignorance and heathenism. 
Turning to his idols with renewed zeal, he prepared to inflict fresh torments on the martyr. No sooner had St. Gregory finished his answer than the king commanded him to be hung by one foot. Then, for all manner of filth to be burnt under his head, as long as he remained hanging with his head downwards, and to beat him with a heavy green stick, thus did the blessed man hang for seven days, during which ten men beat him in succession by order of the king, and at the same time the stench that rose continually from the fire under him choked him and stopped his breathing. Yet in the midst of such horrible tortures, the saint did not even utter a groan, neither did he show signs of pain. Raising his mind to God, he was filled with untold consolation and joy of heart. The wondrous heavenly joy that gladdened his spirit on his, on his countenance, uh, that gladdened his spirit appeared on his countenance to the admiration and astonishment of the beholders. <clears throat> During the seven days he was hanging and being beaten, the martyr uttered many prayers and godly words. All this was reported to the king, who, however much he felt surprised and struck with wonder, yet did not relent from his cruelty out of devotion to his idols. After eight days of that torture, the, com the king commanded that Gregory be taken down and brought to him, and still the saint witnessed for Christ our Savior. Therefore the king commanded that two wooden clubs the size of a shin bone be brought and fitted like the bars of a wine press. Then, placing both of the saint's legs between the clubs, they tied them tight with knotted cords, which they twisted until the blood gushed forth from the fingers of the men who did it. But St. Gregory remained joyful with wondrous endurance, magnifying the Lord. He was so firmly rooted in the faith of Christ that he preferred having his heart of flesh taken from his body and giving himself over to the executioners rather than denying and forsaking our Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing that not even these fresh torments could make the saint yield in his valor, Tiridates gave orders that he should be tried in another way. He sent to fetch iron nails and had them stuck into the soles of the saint's feet, and taking him by the hand, he made him run hither and thither on this side and that, until the ground was sprinkled all over with the blood that spurted from his wounds. The executioners made him run to and fro incessantly. But the saint remembered by such acute torture he was made like unto the crucified Savior, whose hands and feet were cruelly pierced with nails, and thus he rejoiced greatly. Seeing this, the king commanded the attendants to cuff him until he shed a cup full of tears, and his gladness leave him. They then smote him with heavy blows upon the head and beat his eyes repeatedly. Nevertheless, the saint still accounted suffering for Christ our Lord to be all true joy and gladness. Not only was the king not softened at the sight of so much suffering, but he even prepared to inflict on St. Gregory yet more cruel tortures in order, if possible, to make him do his will by respecting the worship of his idols. He therefore commanded them to boil salt, nitre, and strong vinegar together, and all was soon ready. He then placed the martyr on his back and put his head into a carpenter's vice, and inserting a reed into each of his nostrils, he ordered that they pour the horrible matter into each nostril as the saint drew his breath. Thus, while his head was in the vice, they turned through the prayers of our Holy Father, so Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Thus, while his head was in the vice, they turned the screw with a bar and poured the hot mixture through the reeds in order that on reaching the martyr's brain, it might be disturbed, and by thus bringing him to a state of frenzy, to persuade him at last to worship the idols. And they were thus trying to bring the saint's mind from its state of health to that of madness, while he, strengthened with almighty power, endured such dreadful tortures manfully and ceased not to confess and magnify the only true God. After these things, the king commanded that a large sheepskin bag be brought and filled with soot from a chimney and ashes from a furnace. They did not fill it tight, but only so as to appear full, and only so as to hinder the martyr's breathing, for they put it over his head and fastened it just below his chin, in order that while breathing he might stuff his nose and mouth with the mixture of soot and ashes till it reached the brain and injured him, or if it choked him, well and good, they thought, let him be choked. They left him thus six days, and by the grace of Christ, St. Gregory remained marvelously well and unhurt, and he was even strengthened above his other trials, and joyfully gave thanks to God. Tiridates, however, although eyewitness of these wonders, did not awaken to receive the word of truth proclaimed by the saint, but still continued in his hardened state. 
The king again tried to persuade the martyr with promises of benefits, but the saint remained steadfast, showing his true kindness of heart and the earnest desire he had for the king's salvation. His patient words of correction and admonition only further roused the king's wrath against him. Seeing that such tortures of the body could in no way bend the saint's will to the unlawful worship of idols, the king commanded that both his feet be tied together and that boiling water be poured down into his stomach, but the martyr was wondrously supported in this trial also, wherein he would have died but for the strength vouchsafed unto him from above. When this was over, the king command, commanded that he be let down, and he again asked him whether he would obey his orders. With entreaties, he reminded St. Gregory of the greatness and honor he had enjoyed in the palace, and he promised to restore him to his former rank and dignity if he would but once offer incense in worship to the gods. But to this, the blessed Gregory replied, I offer incense and sacrifice to the true and living God, our Lord Jesus Christ. But never will I do so to idols, which neither speak, breathe, nor feel. No, not even if thou command that I be made to suffer yet more than I have hitherto. Having heard such words, the king became very angry and said, Since thou hast dared to say of the gods that they are but carved images without life, I will avenge it on thee. So saying, the king ordered the executioners to hang the martyr by his two hands to a piece of wood in the shape of a cross, tying his hands with thick ropes and his feet also like the Savior Jesus, and then with iron scrapers to tear his sides until the whole place was sprinkled with his blood. This was done, and yet, by the power of God, the saint remained steadfast in his compassion. But the king drew nigh and said to him, Wilt thou not hearken to me, Gregory, now that thou art in such torments? Who is that God of thine who can deliver thee out of my hands? So saying, he commanded that a number of iron spikes be brought in basketfuls to be spread thickly on the ground. Then they placed St. Gregory naked on these spikes and dragged and buried him in them and rolled him about until his body was everywhere pierced through with no place left unharmed. Then the king asked him, Gregory, where is thy God in whom thou trustest? Will he now come and deliver thee out of my hands? But Christ's martyr endured his sufferings with extraordinary patience and remained alive by the power of God, praising Christ God with gladness. And they again cast him into prison. The next day they brought the saint before the king, who greatly wondered at seeing him yet alive, still thinking nothing of torture, and hearing him speak who, he supposed, should have already perished in such tortures as he had undergone. And being enraged that the martyr yet lived and confessed the name of Christ, he commanded that certain iron instruments of torture, made like caps, be put on the knees of God's servant. By means of these, the knees were made to swell up in great lumps, upon which the iron caps were tightened with wedges. They then hanged him thus garroted by his two hands, and left him to suffer in that state for three days. But on the fourth day the king ordered that St. Gregory be taken down and brought before him. Seeing that the more he tortured the saint, the firmer he was, and that he would rather be tortured than not, the king himself was put to shame, and for the moment knew not how to proceed further. But the martyr, filled with love for God and yearning for the salvation of the king and his nation, did not cease to convict the heir of idolatry and proclaim the truth of Christ. Having thus heard the saint say that the more his outward body perished, the more also was he renewed inwardly, and also that if he, the king, did not turn to Christ, he would assuredly be burned in the fire of Gehenna, which is never quenched, King Diodati's wrath was kindled anew, and he said, For that thou saidst all this, I will cast thee into burning fire, and thou shalt there be made to know thy deluded state. So saying, he commanded that some lead be melted in an iron crock, and then poured upon the martyr's body, which was singed and shriveled all over. Yet he did not die. Then they proceeded to pour some of it down the throat of the valiant man of God. It reached his inward parts, yet withal it did not kill him by the power of Christ. Thus was he strengthened with courage and fortitude until it was time, until it was to him as if water were poured over his body. 
And it became evident to all that also in this torture the king's madness was being loudly and openly reproved, while the bystanders treasured up in their minds all the saints' words touching the service and the fear of God. At the end of two years thus spent in torturing the saint, Tiradatis thought it was of no avail for him to talk to him any more. He therefore sent messengers to him, promising him both life and honors, for which he did not care, if he would recant. But if not, and if he still continued obstinate, then to tell him that he would be put to fresh tortures, so as at last to overcome and break down his resistance. So anxious were the king and his nobles to bring St. Gregory to the worship of their gods. Not that the king himself should benefit much by it, but that, if St. Gregory was not made to do it, injury might thence accrue to the heathen worship. At this particular time, however, one of the noblemen, Ardavazd by name, said to the king, O king, live forever. That man, meaning St. Gregory, ought not to live, because he is not worthy of life, nor yet of seeing the light of the sun. For though he has been with us so many years, yet have we not known who he is, until now at last we have found it out. He is the son of Anak who killed thy father Khosroes, and brought the kingdom of Armenia into captivity and ruin. Now therefore, it is not fit that he should live, for he is the son of a man both guilty and worthy of death. The king, having made inquiries and having ascertained the truth of the matter, commanded Gregory to be bound hand and foot and taken to the province of Ararat, and there be kept in the fortress of the town of Ardashat, where he should be cast into a pit and left there till he died. He then went to his winter quarters and published an edict throughout his dominions that whoever was caught dishonoring the gods should be brought forth with hands and feet tied and a rope round his neck, and that his goods should become the property of his informer. But the pit in which they had cast the saint was a hole full of stinking mud used only for malefactors and therefore filled with snakes and with other venomous reptiles, the mention alone of which filled everyone with terror. For when a malefactor happened to be thrown into it, he perished that same day on account of the stench of the place, of the filth and mire, and of the snakes and other creeping things that lived therein. But by the grace of God, the saint was kept from all harm. Such was the quantity of venomous snakes and reptiles in that pit that he sank and was buried in them, swarming and crawling around him. Yet was he in no wise afraid of them, for they, having lost all their cruel nature, did him no harm. But when at first the saint was cast into the pit by the executioners and fell among the reptiles, they then prepared to bite him as they did others, yet they immediately trembled at his presence and were in awe of him, so that contrary to their wanted nature, they now crawled near the saint gently to minister to him and not to hurt him. The very same venomous reptiles which, thought the wicked king, would at once bite the saint to death, now on the contrary watched over him and came to lick his feet. He was thirty years old when cast into that pit, and he remained alive in it fourteen years by the grace of Christ. There was in that fortress a widow woman who believed, named Anna, she received in a vision an order from God to daily prepare a loaf of bread and throw it to the saint whose body was thus supported with necessary food, while he never ceased to praise the most holy trinity in company with the angels as if he were in a temple, rejoicing with joy unspeakable in the divine presence. For every day of his stay in that pit he saw with his eyes open the angels of God, who by their constant attendance upon him evermore gave him fresh strength and happiness, and by the revelation of many hidden things made him glad and joyful in giving glory to God. And there also did he not cease to entreat God in his prayers for the enlightenment of the Armenian nation. And being heard he was, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, bidden to become the illuminator of the Armenian race." What marvelous long-suffering and endurance in that Holy Father! It was vouchsafed to him by the Lord as a special gift in answer to his prayers. Thus only was he enabled to exist during those fourteen years in that pit, full of deep slime and mire, and of venomous beasts of all sorts, as if he were all the time in paradise, giving glory to God, and gladdening his inward heart by doing God's holy will. Here must we depart a little from the course of our narrative. It is all the more necessary, as by so doing we shall more fully bring to light the love of God and the circumstances under which it was displayed, displayed in behalf of the Armenian people. In the days of the wicked emperor Diocletian, there was in a place set apart for the training of virgins given to God in the outskirts of Rome, 
a virgin called Ripsimi. She was born of Christian parents, members of the nobility, who, after enlightening her by baptism, had devoted her to God from her birth and had placed her in that abode, where she grew up in purity and holiness of life under the fostering care of St. Guyana, who was at the head of it. These holy virgins, being satisfied with meager daily food and clothed in the modest apparel that becomes a solitary life of self-denial, ceased not to praise and glorify God by their heavenly conduct, cheerful dispositions, and daily prayers morning and evening, thus turning the life of the body into a spiritual existence and setting the example of a pure and godly life to all who saw them. About this time, the officer in charge of the matter of finding a suitable wife for Diocletian heard of the great beauty of the noble virgin Ripsimi and somehow managed to obtain a portrait of her, well, which he brought to the emperor. When he beheld the majestic beauty of Ripsimi, he at once became enamored of her and sent to her an invitation with the good news that preparations were made for her espousals to him, the emperor. The rejoicings were to last over many days, and ambassadors were also dispatched in haste to make the event known everywhere that, according to royal custom, they should bring presents and offerings from every quarter and celebrate the emperor's marriage with every possible mark of public rejoicings. But what was all that to the Holy Virgin of Christ, who, joined to him with all her heart and in the most ardent love, had chosen to suffer the most cruel pangs of death rather than to be separated from Christ and to suffer her pure, uns unsullied maidenhood? When these innocent lambs became aware of the schemes of the old enemy, who lay in ambush for them under cover of the wicked emperor, intending to shoot in secret his arrows on these maidens devoted to Christ, they remembered their vows of purity, the rules of the way of life they had embraced, and they mourned and wept. Then they poured forth their grief in the most earnest supplications and prayers to God, entreating him to send them help in the hour of need against all the snares and dangers with which they were then surrounded. And having prayed, the virgins were moved by divine leading to take counsel among themselves, and they decided on fleeing to a far country, not as wishing to avoid a timely death, but in order that, by thus escaping, they might keep themselves in innocency of life. So then, while the emperor, who had not the least doubt about the consent of St. Ripsimi, was making preparations for his coming marriage with her, St. Guyana took her foster child Ripsimi and her other companions with priests and others who favored them, fled towards the east, and taking ship, came to Alexandria. From Alexandria they came to Jerusalem, and they visited in pilgrimage the principal holy places around the city. But when they came to Gethsemane and to the sepulcher of the ever-blessed Mother of God, they tarried there to pray, when St. Guyana, taking Ripsimi by the hand, brought her near to the tomb of the Blessed Virgin Mother of God and said, O Mother of our Lord, I commit this one to thee. Keep as a deposit this maid who is wedded to thine only son and signed with the life-giving sign of his cross. Then the Blessed Virgin Mother of God appeared to her in a vision and told her to go to Edessa in Mesopotamia. And while there, visiting the congregations, the Virgin appeared to her a second time and told her to go into Armenia. Coming all together to the eastern parts of Armenia, they went about the mountains of both provinces, and halting at several places, they at last came to Valarshabad, the royal capital of the province of Ararat. There they built a habitation of their own outside the city towards the wine presses of the vineyards to the north of the eastern side. They had, however, no means of subsistence, but one of them knew how to make glass beads and another how to weave blankets, so that taking these things into the city, they sold them and bought the necessities of life. And they thus lived away from the dwellings of men as a small community of virgins occupied in prayer and pleasing God. When Diocletian heard that Ripsimi and her companions had fled, he became very angry, and at once sent messengers in all directions, as well as ambassadors to divers countries, to see if happily they might find them. One of these came from the emperor to Tiridates at Valarshabad, with letters concerning this matter, directing that, if the virgins were found, Guyana and those with her should be given over to death as Christians. Ripsimi, however, was to be sent back to Rome, unless Tiridates desired to keep her for himself. 
When Tyr died his head read the emperor's letter, he gave strict orders that everywhere in his dominions search should be made for Ipsimi and her friends, and at the same time he dispatched ambassadors to every quarter to say that if found, the maid and her companions should at once be brought to him, promising to reward with rank and honors the man who found them. Thus commanded he to watch every road in all the provinces, and indeed, after a few days, tidings were brought to the king from the wine presses where Ripsimi and her companions lived. So then, by the king's order, a band of men was stationed around the dwelling of Ripsimi and her friends, and at the end of three days, these brought intelligence to the king of her exquisite beauty. But when those blessed virgins became aware of this, they poured forth their prayers to God in tears and with uplifted hands, that of his great mercy he would deliver them from the hands of these impious heathens, as he had done before. King Tiridates then greatly desired to see Ripsimi, and the next day gave an order that she should be brought to the palace, but that Guyana and the other virgins be kept within the walls of their dwelling. Then were seen golden-decked canopies with a troop of attendants issuing from the gates of the palace and wending their way towards the abode of Ripsimi until they reached the door of her abode, bringing with them beautiful and gorgeous dresses with other ornaments carried by some of the first men of the land for her to put on, that she might make her entrance into the city with all due pomp and splendor, and after her entrance should then be brought into the presence of the king. For... I'll albeit he had not seen her yet, yet from the reports he had heard of her great beauty, and he was thinking of taking her to wife. St. Guyana, seeing the danger that now befell Ripsimi, went to her and began to say to her, Remember, my child, that thou didst renounce and despise the pomp and magnificence and riches of thy ancestors, and that thou didst sever thyself from it all, and that to those thou hast preferred the brightness of the kingdom of Christ, who created thee, who keeps thee in life, who shall raise thee again from the dead, and who has in store for thee the unspeakable goods he has promised to those who put their trust in him. Thou, child, didst despise and renounce thy father's house and thy bright apparel therein, for the sake of keeping unsullied the purity of thy maidenhood, why then now wouldst thou throw such a sacred deposit as food for dogs? God forbid, child, that thus it should be, but rather let him who has directed us from our childhood until this day make us with thee acceptable unto himself in his eternal kingdom. When Ripsimi heard these words and saw the procession and crowd come on her account, she was strengthened by the Holy Spirit, as it were, with an armor of strength. And putting on her youthful frame, the breastplate of faith, she hastened to take refuge by prayer in the help of her almighty and all-powerful heavenly bridegroom. While Ripsimi was offering her supplications to God with strong crying, the crowd outside was gathering together on her account. It consisted of a number of the king's officers who came with great pomp from the court to lead her to her espousals with the king. Wherefore came they with rejoicings, bringing her the good news of what awaited her, namely to be the queen of the whole Armenian nation. But St. Ripsimi and all her companions, who on the contrary counted all these glad tidings and proclamations as the sorrowful news of death and evil, and lifted up their voices and wept, and with upraised hands and pitiful sighs entreated God mercifully to deliver Ripsimi from the disgrace and shame of such espousals. And they all said together, God forbid that the greatness of this world should seduce us, or that the pleasures thereof should allure us, or that the kingdoms thereof should alarm us, or that persecutions should make us yield, or that sufferings and blows should compromise us, yea, even though our enemies be many, and though they torture us in all manner of ways, shall we then be now afraid of the death you threaten against us? God forbid we should exchange the life eternal that is to come for that which now is and passes away. Wherefore, neither afflictions nor sufferings, neither bonds nor tortures, neither fire nor water, neither the sword nor pleasures, neither life nor death nor anything else, shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. We have committed to him the ward of our purity, we abide in him, and delighting in his love, we will abide as we are until we stand without shame before him in glory. 
Then a violent thunder terrified the crowd, while a voice from heaven was heard encouraging and strengthening St. Rupsimi and her fellows. And this awful thunder continued until all those who stood there were stunned and terrified at it, while others sought to run away from the place. Thus there was great confusion. Then some of the courtiers who had heard the words of Rupsimi and her companions ran and reported them to the king, and told him that the maid would not put on the robes he had sent, nor come, for they were among them scribes learned, learned in the Latin tongue, who no noted all that Ripsimi and her companions had said. And then he answered and said, Since she will not come with pomp and magnificence to the palace, she shall be brought by force and introduced into the royal chamber. The king's officers then went and seized Ripsimi and brought her, now dragging her along, now carrying her in their arms. But she, seeing herself fallen into such great and near danger, cried with a stout heart, and firmly trusting in the help and succor of her almighty heavenly bridegroom, she said, Lord Jesus, help me, deliver me from the sword, and save me, helpless as I am, from the hands of these dogs. And thus did they bring her to the king's palace, even into the royal chamber. But when Ripsimi found herself shut up in the royal chamber, she began with earnest prayer to entreat the Lord to come to her aid. And while the holy maid was yet pouring forth her ardent supplication to God, the king came into the chamber in which she was detained. Meanwhile, the king's servants outside began to prepare the marriage feast, to sing songs of joy, and to be merry all over the palace. Outside the palace, in the city also, they hastened to make preparations, according to the heathen customs of those days, to celebrate the king's marriage with the blowing of trumpets and public rejoicings. But at the same time also the King of Kings, the Almighty, All-Powerful, and All-Merciful Lord God, looked upon his beloved child Ripsimi and heard her prayer, and those of St. Gregory, who, from the bottom of the pit in which he lay, entreated the Lord to strengthen her and to deliver her, so that when the king thought of having his own way with her, she at once received such an amount of manly strength and power from the Holy Spirit, and fought and struggled like a man with the king. She battled with him for some time, and strong and mighty as he was, she overcame him. Then the king, thus beaten and overcome, came outside and commanded that St. Guyana be taken, her head put in stocks, and that she be thus brought to the door of the chamber. And he put words in the mouths of his officers and commanded them at once to bring her that she from outside the door should desire that uh, Ripsimi should desire to give way to him and to save herself and her companions alive. Because the king, having become aware that as Guyana was Ripsimi's foster mother and had taught her to preserve her innocency of life, if only she wished Ripsimi to change her mind, Ripsimi herself would have no objection. Saint Guyana then determined to talk to her, and from outside the door spoke to her in Latin words of comfort that gave her courage. My beautiful maid, said she, my lovely daughter, let not thy stout heart give way, which thou hast had from thy childhood. For from thy mother's womb hast thou been devoted to the Lord, and united to God from thy birth at holy baptism. Be of good courage, and be not shaken from thy hope, and trust in him. Remember that thou, hast, that thou wast nourished in holiness, and adorned with purity of life. Remember, my daughter, that thou wast espoused to Christ, signed with the sign of his holy cross, and given in charge to the blessed Virgin Mother of God. Stand, stand fast in thy purity and innocence, that thou be worthy of the wreath that withers not, and of the marriage feast of Christ. This world is vain and passes away. Its promises are but a shadow, and all its pomp is only vanity. Be strong a little longer, and thou shalt see the glory of God. He will keep thee from defilement and be thy support. God forbid, daughter, that thou shouldst lose the inheritance of the life that is with God for the sake of that which passes away and is not, which today is and tomorrow is no more. When those of the officers who understood Latin heard these words, they smote her on the mouth with a stone, thereby breaking several of her teeth, urging her at the same time to tell Ripsimi to do the king's pleasure. She, however, did not alter her way of speaking. How wonderful that, albeit the holy woman had lost so many teeth, she was nevertheless strengthened by Christ to speak godly words of encouragement as distinctly as before. 
But the officers who stood by and who understood the Roman tongue, hearing what she said, pushed her aside from the door. And then the king once more tried to prevail with Ripsimi and again struggled with her. But the Holy Virgin, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, again defeated and overcame the king and left him on the floor utterly and disgracefully beaten with his crown off his head and his purple robes torn and in disorder while she walked towards the door in her own poor garments all tattered and torn, having gained the victory in her purity by fighting in the strength of Christ. Uh, by fighting in the strength of Christ, her invisible and spiritual enemy, secretly disguised under the form of King Theodotes, until she had fought and overcome him. Then, opening the door of the room, she ran away with all her might, and, favored as she was by the darkness of the night, she escaped safely through the midst of the city, led by her good angel and unseen by the crowd of people, of whom no one either took any notice of her or went after her. Thus did she come to St. Guyana and her companions outside the town towards the wine presses and greeted them with these glad tidings. Be glad, O ye women, that I have not been outraged, and rejoice, O ye wise virgins, for I have smitten down the wicked king, and I have overcome the adversary in the strength of Christ. Now then go ye to the city of Rome and give good news to the apostles, for this is the day of my espousals. Come and see me espoused to Christ. Blow the trumpet and make ready. Clothe yourselves in red blood and bring me to the nuptial chamber and with me be joined to our heavenly bridegroom. Having said this, she went over to a high place on the north side near to the highway that leads to the city of Ardashat and kneeling down, she offered prayers of praise and thanksgiving. <clears throat> but ere it was day, someone having told the king where Ripsimi had fled, he sent at once a troop of officers and executioners with lighted torches before them. Then coming to her, they bound her hand and foot, and first of all sought to cut off her tongue, but she of her own cord put it out. Then they stripped her of her tattered clothing, and striking four posts into the ground, two for the hands and two for the feet, they tied her to them, and placed hand lamps under her for a long time, roasting her body with the flame. They then thrust sharp flints into her bosom, and cutting open her body, they emptied it out. But while she was yet alive, they dug out her eyes, and then cut her to pieces limb by limb, for they thought that it was by some magical art that she had been able to baffle the king. They said, therefore, that whosoever resisted or disobeyed him should be treated after this manner. Thus was the blessed Ripsimi's martyrdom accomplished in Christ. She counted as less than nothing all the pomps of this vain and passing world with all the glory, luxuries, and pleasures in which women delight and which she would have enjoyed in the royal palace and decked herself in the most precious ornaments of a spotless innocence. Thus clad in the pure garments that befit the spiritual espousals in heaven was she honored with the valor of a martyr and in company with angels admitted at the marriage feast of her heavenly bridegroom above. St. Ripsimi's companions, having heard of her end, came and gathered together what was left of her remains. But the executioners rose against them and put them all to the sword in number thirty-three virgins, all of whom offered themselves with a willing heart in sacrifice for the name of Christ, and giving thanks and glorifying God, they ended their life together in the Lord. One of them, whose name was Mariamne, lay at home sick at her dwelling near the wine presses, and could not join the rest. They went and slew her also, who, when about to expire, said, I thank thee, good Lord, that also of thy bounty thou hast not left me, because through illness I could not follow my companions and die with them. But thou, Lord, who art good and gracious, receive me and join my spirit with the band of thy martyrs, my sisters and companions, who have joined thy beloved Ripsimi. Having said this, she was put to death and died in the Lord, so that thirty-four virgins in all suffered martyrdom that day with Ripsimi, whose bodies were drawn asunder and given for food to the wild beasts of the field and to the birds of the air, but they would not touch them, neither did any smell of corruption come from them. Meanwhile, the king did not seem to feel his shame and reproach at having been overcome and beaten by a young maiden, neither did he take it to heart. Yet, having been ravished by her exquisite beauty, he sorrowed at her death. <clears throat> Behold, said he, and see the witchery of that Christian race, how many they ruin forever by drawing them away from the worship of the gods, cheating them out of the pleasures and honors of this earthly life, and are not afraid to die. 
but especially see their bewitchment of that wonderfully lovely Rip Ripsimi, the like of whom there was not anywhere in the world among those born of women, see the craft of them who, by their arts, gave her strength enough to get the better even of me. The next day the king gave orders about Guyana. Uh, first, that her tongue should be torn off with the nape of her neck, and then that she be put to death by slow torture. For, said the king, she dared by her wicked counsel to cause the death of one who was gifted with divine beauty, thus thinking scorn of the favor I have lavished on her, therefore shall she die of a slow death. Then the chief executioner, going from the presence of the king, ordered her to be brought with her two companions in chains outside the town at the southern gate, near the bridge over the river, where criminals were usually put to death. And in order to ingratiate himself with the king, he prepared to torment that poor woman even more cruelly than the king had ordered. They then drove into the ground four posts for every woman. After this, the executioners tore off the garments of those women from them and tied every woman to four posts. They then bored a hole through the skin of their heels, inserted a tube, and blew through it, and then flayed the women alive from the feet upwards as far as the breasts. But shrink not with horror, O ye that hear of these things, for albeit they were stripped of the skin of their bodies, they were all the more endued with the divine graces of the Spirit. But rather mark how little they thought of the most horrible sufferings of the body, and how, when in the midst of them, they ceased not to seek Christ with fervent prayers poured forth from a heart fondly attached to him, and with an earnest desire to be with him, said, Remember us, O merciful and compassionate Lord, since for thy sake are we slain all the day long, and are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But the chief executioner, seeing that to strip them of their skin was to them like taking off their garments without the least inconvenience to them, who made proof of the utmost courage, and hearing that they spoke of the Lord Jesus, he commanded the nape of the neck of every one to be cut open, and her tongue to be torn off through it, according to the king's order, thus striking as they thought at the root of their prayers, which they took to be mutterings and charms of witchcraft. They then thrust sharp flints into their bosoms, and strewed the contents of their bodies over them, and ere they were dead, they cut off their heads with a sword, and so did they die in Christ." But if anyone should inquire into the number of them, we must remark that those who left the land of Rome together and who thence came to Armenia were more in number than those who suffered martyrdom. These were, together with St. Ripsimi and St. Guyana, 37 in all. The others, however, had left these before their martyrdom to go to divers places and to preach the gospel there, and so did not fall into the hands of the tormentors. Of their company were Nina and Mani. When they came to the hills of Taranagi, Mani went to the mountain of Sabuk, where she led the life of an anchorite and died at rest in the Lord. But St. Nina came to Georgia and turned the Georgians to the faith of Christ through her preachings and the wonders she wrought. Tiridates continued six days in the deepest grief after the death of Ripsimi on account of her exquisite beauty, after which he gave himself up to hunting for a time. Everything was now ready for the sport, the nets were spread, the snares were set, and other toils prepared and arranged for the king's chase in the royal domains called Shemagan. But as he got into his chariot to leave the city, a chastisement fell upon him suddenly from the Lord. An unclean spirit smote him and thrust him out of the chariot, and the king began to tear and devour his own flesh, raving mad. And suddenly he was like the king of Babylon of old, as it were, changed from the form of a man into that of a brute, not, however, of a graceful one, but into the vile appearance of a wild boar. He went, therefore, and mixed with the wild boars, and once with them in their cover of reeds began like them to eat grass, and naked and foolish, to roam and beat about among the mountains and on the plains. They tried to keep him in confinement within the city, but could not by reason of his savage disposition and ferocity, rendered far worse by the evil spirits that had taken their abode within him and wrought in him. And many of the men of the city and others who belonged to the army who had joined or assisted the king in putting the martyrs to death were all driven so mad with the divers' diseases brought on by evil spirits that they took to gnawing their own bodies. And all the king's familiar friends, his servants, and his officers were smitten with plagues, so that the distress and affliction of the king's house was exceedingly great by reason of these chastisements, and wailing and woe spread all over the country. Now King Tiridates had a sister called Trosovitukut. She was modest and well-behaved, like one of the virgins of old. 
She was not devoted to the service of the idols, and she did not, like other women, let loose her tongue, although she was not a Christian. And yet, from innate delicacy, she did not marry, but continued a virgin. And for these reasons, she did not share in the plagues that fell upon the king and his house. And above this, she was thought by God worthy of being the first to receive the glad tidings of the general cure of all this affliction in a vision she had from him, and in which she was told to fetch out of the pit the Holy Father Gregory, through whom they would they should receive the health of their bodies and the light of their souls. She then came to the governors of the city and told them the vision she had had, saying, I had a vision last night. A man in bright light came to me and said, There is for you all no hope whatever of relief from the plagues that afflict you, except you send to the city of Ardashat and bring thence the man Gregory, who was kept there a prisoner. When he comes, he will show you the cure and healing of your diseases. When they heard this, they began to laugh at it and said, How can this be? Maybe thou also art gone mad, for lo, this is the fifteenth year since he was let down into the deep pit, in which not even a bone of him could now be found. For the very first day he was let down, he must have died, from the snakes and other venomous reptiles, as well as from the deep mire of that hole. The same vision appeared to her a second time, but with repeated threats that if she did not at once give the message, greater sufferings and plagues should fall upon the people and the king. Again then did Khosrow Vituk relate, relate the words of the angel in great fear to the same governors of the city. Then they sent a principal man among them, one called Oda, to the city of Ardashat to bring them St. Gregory. And when he came to the city, the chief man thereof came, came out to meet him and inquired of him the cause of his coming. To whom he replied, I came to fetch Gregory, a prisoner in this city. But they wondered greatly and said, We do not know whether he be yet alive, for it is now a long time since they cast him into the pit. Oda then told them the vision and the circumstances thereof, at which they were all greatly astonished. They then came to the house in which the pit was, and brought pope the ropes long and strong, which they let down, uh, which they let above which they let from above down into the depth of the hole. And Oda cried with a loud voice and said, Gregory, if thou art yet alive in the deep below, thou shalt now come out. For the Lord thy God, whom thou servest, has commanded us to bring thee out. Then the saint, hearing these words, stood at once on his feet, and taking hold of the ropes, pulled them. Then they above, thereby understanding that he had heard them, hauled him up and out of the pit. Finding his body had grown brawny and black, they soon washed him and put on him suitable garments. And with joy did they then bring him to Valarshabad, where the chief men of the city awaited him outside the walls. And when they saw in the distance Gregory with the men who had gone to fetch him and the multitude which escorted him, they went forward to meet him. Then did one witness a marvelous sight, the king like a boar, and others possessed with demons, with many of that city, and of the nobles thereof, who were raving mad, were seen running together to the same spot to meet him, driven as they were to do so by the demons. And falling down before him, they wallowed, foaming and tearing their own bodies. And the king, with the appearance and manner of a boar rushing forward, grunting, roaring, wallowing, and foaming at the mouth, was awful to look at, when at the coming of the saint he ran forward on all fours with the rest. The saint, however, had pity on them, knelt down on the spot and prayed for them, and they were at once delivered from the demons and returned to their former senses. And he commanded them to clothe themselves and to cover their nakedness, because when uh, of another mind they wore no clothing, covering themselves only with shame. The king, however, was not at once restored to his former state by the saint, but when rescued from the violent hold of the demons, he only gradually returned to a sensible state and recovered his sound mind. Then they put garments on him to hide him from the gaze of the vulgar. Then the princes and nobles coming with the king embraced the feet of St. Gregory and entreated him, saying, Forgive us all the evil we have done thee. But he, raising them and making them stand upright, said to them, I also am a man like you, and I have a body like your own. But ye now learn to know God your creator, him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, the sun, moon, and the stars, and all the other things. He alone is able to make you whole. He then began to ask them where they had put the bodies of the witnesses for Christ. What witnesses meanest thou, Lord, said they to him? The witnesses for God, answered the saint whom ye put to death with cruel torments. 
Then they showed him the spot where the remains of St. Ripsemia and her companions were thrown. He then gathered together their relics from the place where they had been slain and found that by the power of God, those remains had been kept free from corruption, though there were nine days and nine nights since those bodies were cast outside the town, where neither the beasts of the field nor the birds of the air had come nigh them. He then carried the relics of the martyrs to the wine presses where their convent stood, which he then made his own residence. And there, when night came, he watched in prayers to God that he would vouchsafe to the king and to the whole people a sensible mind to understand the words which he would thenceforth speak to them to the salvation of their souls. The next day, St. Gregory began to instruct the people, and in order to prepare them to yield themselves obedient to the preaching of the gospel, he commanded them to continue fasting for sixty days. And there in his abode at the wine presses, he taught those who came to him the word of life for a period of sixty-five days. But while the multitude that had not been afflicted with plagues from above came and went as they liked during that time, the king, who was not yet cured of his boorish appearance, and those who with him had also been punished by God, never parted from the saint for fear of the plagues that yet rested on them. But they continued night and day at the door of the saint among the vineyards, covered with sackcloth and sitting on ashes after the example of the Ninevites. And thus did they fast sixty days according to the saint's commandment. Meanwhile, the hearts of the people were day by day more and more enlightened by the preaching of God's service. They renounced the vain worship of their lying idols, the work of their own hands, and with their whole heart were turned to the worship and service of God, while they vied one with another in their earnestness to fast and to pray, and with their hearts to yield obedience to the divine teaching they received from St. Gregory. But when the resting place for the remains of the holy martyrs was finished, which St. Gregory had bade them prepare, according as he had been instructed in a heavenly vision, and the whole people stood together within the place of worship, the house of God, the saint began to speak to them, saying, Kneel down, all of you, in prayer in presence of the Lord, that he will heal you of your plagues. And they did so. Then St. Gregory, himself kneeling down with them, continued in prayer to God and with earnest entreaties and supplications, prayed for the healing of the king who hitherto was only partly restored to his former appearance. Oh, the wonder, for it happened that while he was in prayer and in tears with the people, the king shook off from his body all at once the whole appearance of the boar he had on him. His wanted face and countenance returned to him, and he was thus completely cured, and his body made sound, at the sight of which all were filled with joy and blessed and glorified God for it. Likewise, those among the people who were blind, halt, sick of the palsy, lepers, scurvy, Gaudi, who had the dropsy and were possessed with de demons, were all severally released and cured of their plagues. But the most wonderful part of it is this, that through the prayers of the saint they were not only healed of their bodily infirmities, but were also cured within of their spiritual diseases. And... Thus they exchanged their inveterate evil habits of sin and of error in various ways for a modest and correct behavior and orderly conversation, to the astonishment of all who saw them. No sooner was the king cured of those plagues by the prayers of St. Gregory than he at once came to knowledge of God, his creator and savior, by whose rod he was made to suffer such things. And thus, sincerely repenting his sins in his inmost heart, by God's great mercy vouchsafed unto him, he turned to him and clave to him. As his understanding became enlightened and clear by his faith in God when he heard the word of life, while at the same time his heart was being kindled with love for him, he wept incessantly over his former wicked ways. Thus humbling himself to the lowest depth, he, with his whole heart, yielded unreserved obedience to the gospel of Christ and burned with desire to do only that which pleased God and to spread the glory of his holy name. Wherefore, as soon as he was completely recovered, he would brook no delay in doing all he could to establish the worship of God in every part of his kingdom. 
Thus, whithersoever St. Gregory went with the king and his nobles, he pulled down the temples, breaking in pieces the idols and all the carved or molten images, the work of human folly and ignorance, and the temples where the souls of men were ruined, and all manner of wickedness, transgressions, and sins perpetrated, did he break, pull down, demolish, and exterminate, until he left not a trace of them. And he taught and confirmed in the faith of Christ those who before had been living in all manner of abominations. While teaching the people through the Holy Gospel to turn from their vain worship to the easy yoke of the service of Christ, he persuaded them not only by word of mouth, but also by signs and miracles, drawing the people to the faith of Christ by the cure of divers diseases and sicknesses, which he wrought in the Savior's name, whereby that name and the power of the cross were greatly honored and magnified. Up to this point, however, St. Gregory had not deemed himself worthy to receive the most honorable office of the priesthood. But as it was no longer possible to hide the necessity of having priests and a bishop for the spiritual wants of the nation, he made the king acquainted with it. I must tell you, said he, to bring from one of the neighboring Christian nations a priest who shall enlighten you and be your shepherd. The king, his queen Ashkin, and his sister... Having discussed the matter as regarded St. Gregory, said among themselves, We must lose no time in seeing that he received holy orders to administer to us the sacraments of the church, and be the chief pastor who shall lead the whole nation. The king then sent an order to all his princes and nobles to meet him in the province of Ararat, in the city of Valarshabad, whither he returned to the seat of his kingdom after his tour through the provinces. Thither came all the governors of provinces with the nobles and great men of the realm to the king. The whole council with one heart, one mouth, and one voice requested Gregory to receive the grace of the priesthood. <clears throat> but when he heard of it, he declined to take upon himself the office, saying, I am not sufficient for so high an office. It is beyond all expression honorable and sacred. Seek ye now someone worthy of it, and you will find him. But afterwards an angel of God appeared to St. Gregory, bidding him in no wise to resist or gainsay the choice of him to the sacred office. For, said the angel, it is commanded thee by Christ. The saint therefore yielded at once and said, The will of God be done. Then the king, filled with awe and with joy, undertook and determined with every precaution to send St. Gregory to receive the laying on of hands. He called together his princes and desired them to appoint and to prepare chief men who should accompany St. Gregory on his travels and bring him to Caesarea of Cappadocia to the Archbishop St. Leontius to be by him ordained and consecrated first bishop of the land of Armenia. Fifteen princes being ordered by the king then made preparations to accompany St. Gregory. They started out and came into Cappadocia. And great were the rejoicings of the Christians, who flocked to the site when they heard of the wonders wrought by God, and of the salvation that had reached the converts of Armenia, being thus honored as they went along until they came to the metropolis called Caesarea. There they met St. Leondius, the archbishop, and the clergy of every order. And, having greeted them, they told them all that God had done for them, and presented a letter which the king had written to the archbishop. St. Leontius welcomed them with gladness and with rejoicings in the whole city. He took the letter, and having read its contents, was filled with joy and gave glory to Christ. Many bishops were then invited and gathered together at Caesarea, and according to the Holy Gospel, they laid hands on St. Gregory, St. Leontius being at the head of them. Then, not many days after his ordination, St. Gregory was dismissed with great honor, carrying letters from St. Leontius to return to his see commended as he was to the grace of God. Thence they came straight to Sebastia, and tarried there certain days, where St. Gregory, seeing a number of godly brethren, persuaded them to come with him, that he might ordain them priests for his own country also. Of them a great multitude followed him. Wheresoever they came, they stayed some little time, and wherever they passed, crowds of people and of the clergy flocked to see the living martyr for Christ, St. Gregory, and receive his blessing. And they said one to another, Come, let us go and see St. Gregory, who has just arrived. He is the man who endured suffering so many years for the sake of Christ, and who, being found a faithful martyr, has won for himself the name of Confessor. <clears throat> 
Thus, under the Lord's guidance and protection, did they pass through many places with spiritual joy and gladness, until they came back into greater Armenia. Beginning his ministry as bishop, St. Gregory went round about all the provinces of the kingdom, and everywhere in cities, towns, and villages, he set up churches with an altar in every church, and he baptized and ordained priests and other ministers for the wants of the congregations. And having appointed and placed them, he enjoined to them the care of their flocks in the faith and in the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ to the salvation of their souls. Then the king came with all his suite to meet the saint on to meet the saint on the banks of the Euphrates, where they were all filled with joy at meeting together once again. When the days of fasting and all preparations were completed, at the dawn of day, St. Gregory took the king with his queen Ashken and his sister Kosrovitukt and all the great men of the realm with the soldiers in camp and brought them to the banks of the Euphrates. And performing the ceremonies ordered by the church, he baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. First the king, then his queen, his sister, the great men of the court, his suite, and in general all the people that were with him. He then changed the name of the king from Tiridates to John. And having tarried eight days there by the river Euphrates, he baptized the whole multitude of people. The illuminator of souls then visited every part of the kingdom in order to fill every place with Christian teaching and doctrine, to build churches and to ordain clergy for the strengthening of the new converts in the faith of Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, the pious Tiridates, for his part, was doing all he could to settle the maintenance of ecclesiastics and to provide for their income. For having now withdrawn his mind from earthly cares, he fixed it only on divine things. He also gave orders to the people to worship and only to serve the maker of heaven and earth, and gave all diligence to augment the number of ministers of the altar of the Lord in every place to the confirmation and increase of the service of God. St. Gregory, on the other hand, did his best to come to every place of the kingdom of Armenia to lay the foundation of churches and to multiply worthy priests and clerics, and consecrating bishops from place to place, he put every one of them in a diocese to find by himself. He guided and directed them all in his precepts by a faithful and true conduct, and by watchful care to prove themselves good overseers of their enlightened flock. And he advised the pious king to establish schools from place to place with fixed incomes, and to command that in every district the children should be gathered together and instructed in the pious writings of wise and good men. The children were thus divided into two classes, the one being taught Syriac letters and the other Greek. Thus did the saint minister to spread all over Armenia from end to end of the kingdom the work of preaching the gospel of Christ. And he also brought many to the faith of Christ from among Persians, Assyrians, Medians, and Chaldeans. And added to this, though he had given in charge the wide sowing of the word of life to many of his own priests, Yet did he consider that it behooved him to fulfill in this respect the duties and pattern of a faithful steward and attend to the ministry himself. At all seasons and in all weather, in summer and winter, by night and by day, untiringly and earnestly, in the ways of an evangelist, on this side of the country and on that, rushing with irresistible force against adversaries before kings and princes and before all the heathens, did the Illuminator carry the saving name of Jesus and enlightening every soul with the knowledge of God by the new birth of baptism made them children of God. Many prisoners also, and captives, and others who were being tormented by tyrants, did he rescue with great display of the glory of Christ. Many unjust bonds for debt did he also tear up and destroy. Many also who were afflicted and who lived in constant fear did he comfort by his teaching, and by placing before them the hope of the glory of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, well established in their souls, did he bring them round to unfeigned joy. And with untired efforts, laboring as he did at the word of life, did he turn souls from the vain worship of idols to the service of God and to the hope of the kingdom of heaven. Oh, the wonderful apostolic life of the holy illuminator Gregory. So remarkable was the holiness of his conversation, and so powerful was his preaching that the hard hearts of stone of men given to sin melted into floods of tears and were confirmed in uprightness of life, in repentance, and in the true worship of God. 
But who would be sufficient to tell the number of those who devoted themselves to the service of Christ, not only by keeping his commandments, but also by taking up the cross in closer fellowship with him in the many monasteries built by St. Gregory, both in inhabited and in desert places? <clears throat> After having thus scattered from the land of Armenia the gloom of ignorance and heathenish superstition, with the light of the knowledge of God, and after providing all parts of the country with bishops, teachers, and preachers, drawn by the sweetness of God's love, the blessed Gregory went among high mountains, there to give himself up altogether to ascetical labors in a life of stillness. There he increased his bodily fasting and privation, lest he should let pride get the better of him, from the recollection of the wonderful endurance with which he had formerly borne his unexampled sufferings and from the thought of his apostolic deeds for the conversion of the country, accompanied with wonders wrought by the grace of Christ. In this wise did he limit himself regularly to, last, uh, to fast forty days, until the day he was called by Christ to his rest. Meanwhile, the church which St. Gregory had planted, and which had tasted the blessing of his spiritual oversight, ill brooked his absence from her but especially King Tiridates, who, living apparently a sovereign in his palace, nevertheless led therein a life of deep repentance and always longed to have St. Gregory with him. He often asked him to come to him, yet the saint would not consent. But the greater time he thus spent in solitude, making his visits fewer and fewer, the more did the churches in general long to see him, they felt as if they were being deprived of their devoted pastor, who was to them like the Savior, and as if they were growing faint thereby, as the like of him was nowhere among them. For none of the many spiritual pastors and preachers he had ordained all over the land bear greater comparison with him than the stars of heaven do with the sun in brightness. Meanwhile, Artavast, commander-in-chief of all the Armenian forces, who got information about the sons of St. Gregory, told of them to the king, who hitherto had had no knowledge of the matter, Let us take note of the virtuous conduct of St. Gregory's sons, who, though they knew their father to be so remarkable, and to have reached so high a degree of exaltation, nevertheless did not wish to intrude themselves upon him, in, in order to seek honor to themselves, as he also did not call them to himself, unless so moved by God. St. Gregory, then, had two sons, as we briefly mentioned before, the eldest of whom, Varthanis, was married when a layman, but, uh, was married when a layman, but had afterwards been called from choice to the holy and pure life of a presbyter. But the younger son, Aristagus, had from his childhood embraced a life of solitude, having attached himself to the hermit Nicomachus, with whom he spent his life in the wilderness in a separate cell. However, living on herbs, clad in a coarse cloak, and patiently bearing heat and cold in that retreat, denying himself the necessary sleep by standing on his feet, satisfied as he was with an occasional stretch on the bare ground. Thus did he mortify his body by continued endurance and self-denial, which enabled him to abide firm in the grace of Christ against the temptations and assaults of spiritual enemies, being in prayer day and night and spending his time in reading the Holy Scriptures and in praises and thanksgivings, fed and supported as he was by meditating on the mysterious dispensation of the world's redemption through Christ." When he became aware of the holy life of St. Gregory's sons, the king was filled with gladness. He at once chose three men from the most honorable of the land and sent them with a letter into Cappadocia, requesting that the two sons of St. Gregory be brought to him without delay. When they came into Cappadocia, uh, Cappadocia they found uh, Varathanes at Caesarea, er, but Aristakis was in the wilderness. He, however, would not leave his solitude until a great many Christians persuaded him that it was God's will that he should obey this call. He then consented to go to the king with the princess sent to fetch him, <clears throat> and the two brothers then departed from Caesarea. When they were brought in the presence of King Tiridates, he greatly rejoiced and went himself with them to look for St. Gregory, whom they found in a desert place of the province of Taranagi, 
on a mountain called Mania Arek, after the virgin Mani, who had lived and died there in the Lord. And the king then entreated the saint, saying, Since thou lovest a retired life and wishest not to abide among us, we pray thee to consecrate thy son instead of thyself. The holy shepherd heard the king's request, and having come down from the mountain, he called together a synod of bishops and priests and consecrated Aristakis, primate of all Armenia, in his place, for he was most like his father in his whole conduct. Then St. Gregory went with him the round of the whole country, refreshing and encouraging the flock to abide firm in the commandments of God and in the true service of him, and then returned to his favorite abode in the wilderness. Armenia had now been converted 18 years, and everything was being done by the good King, Ter King Tiridates for his spiritual welfare, when news reached him of all the wonderful things done by the Emperor Constantine and of his conversion to the faith of Christ, for all of which King Tiridates returned thanks to God with great joy, because the whole earth was being filled with his glorious name. And he wrote to the emperor, who had just embraced the faith of Christ, congratulating him and rejoicing with him. The Christian emperor answered in the same spirit of love, and the faith which is in Jesus Christ thus was the bond of union between them, whereby their brotherly love might continue firm and unshaken. Afterwards there appeared at Alexandria the profane Arius, who taught that the Son of God is not of one essence with a father, but that he is a stranger to him and created, that he was not begotten of the Father before the ages, but came into existence in time, and is not equal but inferior to the Father. And in order to refute and drive away such wicked heresy from the church, the pious emperor Constantine, having taken counsel with many hierarchs, gave orders to call together a council of bishops in Nicaea, a city of Bithynia. <clears throat> Thither also came the emperor himself to give help and countenance to the fathers there assembled, and waiting on their orders with all humility. Then came a letter from the emperor to Tiridates, asking him to take St. Gregory and to bring him to the council. King Tiridates himself, however, would not consent to come, as he was then in fear of danger for his kingdom from the princes of neighboring states. St. Gregory likewise would not leave his life of quiet to go to the council. But they, but they too sent Aristakis with a letter telling the actual state of the case and their reasons for not coming, who, arriving at Caesarea, went with Bishop Leontius to Nicaea, where 318 bishops assembled against the heresy of Arius in the year of our Lord, 325, when they anathematized and excommunicated him. When the business of that synod was completed, Aristarchus brought away with him the twenty principal canons thereof, and came to his father and to King Tiridates in the city of Valarshabad, and there laid those decrees before them, whereat they both greatly rejoiced. St. Gregory took them up and read them, and setting to them in words the seal of his approbation, said, Now let us praise him who was before the ages, worshipping the most holy trinity and the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and under the ages of ages. Amen. After Aristarchus came back from Nicaea, St. Gregory spent some little time with him, and then returned to his wilderness, and after that showed himself more, while Aristarchus shepherded the church of Armenia in his place. Then, after having lived a length of time out of the sight of men, but in company with angels, his mind withdrawn from the things of the world, and his inward man strengthened by prayer, his thoughts dwelling on high, in unspeakable meditations on heavenly things, enlightened by the revelation to him of things hidden and of unsearchable mysteries, he lived refreshed and quickened every day at the sweet spring of God's unspeakable love. And having thus run the course of his life on earth, while keeping the faith and earnestly longing with an affectionate heart for a sight of God's countenance, he at last, full of good works, exchanged this miserable existence for the life that never ends among the angels above, whither his Savior beckoned him come. But the saint whose cell was a hollow in a juniper tree, there gave up his pure spirit, and his body remained some time in that cell where shepherds found it by accident. Not knowing whose body it was, they covered it with a heap of stones, and in such a shroud did they wind up the priceless treasure of which they were not aware. 
It was so willed by God's providence that the saint's body should thus remain several years hidden from the sight and knowledge of men. But after many years, the body of the saint was shown to a hermit called Kamig, who took it and laid it to rest in the village of Thorcan, to the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ. The thrice-blessed illuminator, St. Gregory, took his seat on the throne of the first hierarch of Armenia in the year of our Lord 302, and lived thirty years in that high office, for from his ordination in the eighteenth year of the reign of King Tiridates until the forty-sixth year, when St. Gregory no longer appeared among men, are reckoned about thirty years. Therefore was the year 331, the last of his episcopate. He was Parthian by birth, of the province of Balki, and of the distinguished and royal race of the Arsacidae. He rose to be the true Orient in the east of Armenia, like a rational sun, and a spiritual brightness in the depth of the wickedness of idolatry, the source of blessedness and of edification for all. A divine palm tree indeed, planted in the house of the Lord, that blossomed in the courts of our God. Spread abroad as he was among so many peoples, he gathered all into one unto the glory and praise of God. But after some years, when the independent kingdom of Armenia began to fall, it pleased the providence of God to order that the relics of St. Gregory should be removed to Constantinople in the days of the Emperor Zeno, who reigned in the year 474 of our salvation, and thence after a long time to Italy. So that, as during the saint's earthly sojourn, his endurance and the apostolic grace of his works were a help to very many, so also, after his repose in the Lord, was he still to be a help through the wonders wrought by his relics honored throughout the world. Here then shall we make an end of our poor and significant narrative in honor of the thrice blessed Holy Father Gregory the Illuminator, to the glory of Christ our God, who is blessed forever. Amen. <laughs>